All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in for today's webinar about predictions and planning for PR in 2023. The past year was an interesting one, to say the least. I think we can all agree on that, both in general and specifically in the PR industry. Um, we saw a lot of predictions from 2022 unfold and many new ones emerge as well. So I'm excited to chat with our panelists today about what we saw, what they thought of it, what we expect to see in years to come. So just to start us off with a few introductions, I will go ahead and introduce you to our awesome panel that we have today. It's one of the larger panels that we've had on a Propel webinar, so it's super exciting. So these communications professionals have spanned a lot of different parts of the industry, a lot of specializations as well. So we'll get a lot of specifics from each of their background. For myself, I'm Sam Scurbano. I'm the marketing manager at Propel. I have been in a few different strategic communications roles before this across industries, including a nonprofit PR strategy role and in-house cybersecurity PR software. So to introduce our panelists, I'll get started with Michelle Garrett. Michelle is a public relations consultant, writer, and speaker. She works with B2B clients, helping them create content, earn media coverage, and best position them as thought leaders. She co-hosts a weekly session on Twitter spaces with PR Lunch Hour and is the founder and host of the popular weekly Twitter chat, hashtag freelance chat. Um, Michelle was once again named in the top 10 most influential, influential PR professionals in 2022. So congratulations on that. And thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. Um, Ken Jacobs is another one of our panelists today. Ken is the principal of Jacobs Consulting and Executive Coaching which helps empower PR and communications leaders and executives to become more effective. His company also helps agencies grow um, business, manage for profitability, improve client service, enhance team performance, communications, and leadership skills via training and consulting. So prior to launching his companies, Jacob spent 25 years in management and leadership positions with a number of PR agencies. Jacobs discusses leadership with some of the PR and comms industry's most respected leaders via taking the lead, his quarterly leadership column and PRSA strategies and tactics, and the similarly named video podcast on his website and YouTube channel. He is a regular presenter at PRSA Counters Academy and various PRSA chapters and loves living the down the shore in of Surrey Park, New Jersey. No Bruce sightings yet. So thank you, Ken, for being here. Yeah, I'm going to say that was my short bio. That needs to be tightened. I was like, you know, like, <laughs> no for it. So for the next one, we'll we'll tighten that more. Apologies to everyone. <laughs> All good. I mean, the more they know, the better. They can understand okay. where their advice is coming from, what your expertise okay. is. So don't even worry. Next up, we have Nicole Ravlin, president and CEO of Juniper. Juniper. Um, for more than two decades. Nicole has advised companies of all sizes on their communications and marketing strategies and helped put those plans into motion. Having worked both in-house and on the agency side, she brings a unique perspective to the table and an understanding of how marketing can be used to drive sales, increase brand awareness, and attract the right talent to work on your team. In addition to her work with clients, Nicole speaks across the US on ever-evolving field of public relations and is taught as an adjunct professor for PR at Champlain College. She serves as the executive at the executive level on the board of directors for Vermont Public Radio and resides in Shelburne, Vermont with her two sons and a dog box. Thank you for being here, Nicole. She's also a Propel client, so we love having their team on board using Propel. Thanks for having me. And again, I, it just... It, the dog box is behind me asleep. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see if we get any barking, any input from Boggs. That's today. right. He has some um, thoughts. His industry predictions matter too. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Latricia Woods, founder and president of Mahogany Zan Communications. 
She received both a Bachelor of Arts degree in communications with an emphasis in public relations and a Master's of Arts, Master of Arts degree in communication with an emphasis in organizational communications from WSU. She has had a over 25 year career in public relations that includes experience with nonprofits and government agencies where she kind of started off her career. She founded her PR and public affairs firm in 2012 and transitioned from full-time employee to full-time entrepreneur in 2013. Her new journey has included speaking to organizations across the country on topics including communications best practices, entrepreneurship, empowering your personal brand, and more. She's a member and former Kansas chapter president of PRSA and recently achieved her accreditation in public relations. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Latricia, for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, let's get into it. Now that I've talked your ear off a little bit already, a little summary of our agenda is to get a little bit more background about Propel for starters, take a look back into PR in 2022, and then 2023 predictions and planning. And we'll wrap it up by talking about how you can stay ahead of the curve in the future and just always be up to date on these trends, one step ahead of them and ready to succeed in PR. So a little bit more about Propel. We are proud to be the first PR tool built by PR people for PR people. Our CEO, Zach Cutler, founded Propel in 2019 after running his own agency for about nine years. In his agency, Zach was always on the lookout for the best technology to manage his agency and he would piece a bunch of tools together but didn't feel it was quite right for what he was trying to accomplish and measure so he eventually sold his agency and took on propel to run this company full time and change pr for agencies and independent pr pros so now we're on a mission to democratize and make PR tech accessible to the masses. We support leading brands and agencies like Real Chemistry, Microsoft, NPR, and more by reimagining earned media. We've launched many first-of-a-kind features, including just recently a PRM3 new media monitoring um, offering. So if you haven't seen that, make sure to check it out. And the first Gmail and Outlook integrated plugins. So. That's enough about us. Let's get into what you're here for, which is a planning and prediction session about 2023's PR landscape. So let's take a look back at PR in 2022, because it's only natural we consider the past year before planning for the next. So here's a list of just a handful of some of the top predictions we saw across news outlets, across discussions and planning sessions moving into this year. So I wanted to start out by asking our panelists a little bit more about which trends stood out to them as actually a bit of the undertone of this year, um, which ones maybe didn't stand out so much, what did we not expect, what do you think no one saw coming at all. So Ken, I'll go ahead and put you on the spot first today. Okay. Are there any trends you saw when working with your agency leader clients that you thought were actually very strong predictions early on in the year, which background for everyone here, the majority of Ken's um, executive leader clients are actually in the PR space. Thank you. So, you know, I would say there were some on here that I definitely saw happen and some that I think are great for our business and our industry. DEI certainly um, two that I don't like as much only because I can't imagine doing TikTok videos. But but the whole notion of influencer marketing and video content, happy and agree, podcasting becomes more and more and more important. So I see all of those, and I think um, trust absolutely critical. So I think perhaps most of your uh, audience, uh, you know, are focusing on trust as it relates to PR and PR success. My focus is always through the leadership lens 
And so I would just say, as you look to the importance of trust from brands and in PR, I think the critical notion of if you want to be an effective leader in 2022, and I think in 2023, the importance of building trust, absolutely critical, always was critical, became more important last year, becomes more important as we look to the future. And if I can add one more that I don't quite see on here, um, but this focus on purpose, you know, what are our agencies all about? What are our solo practice, you know, what is our, our, what are our individual practices all about? You know, what, it, what purpose do our clients have? Agency, big, small, individual, and all our clients, the notion of purpose, I think, got, for me, much bigger last year. And I think that'll continue. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. And even tying those few trends together with um, DE&I purpose um, and a few of these things we're seeing. Um, I even see uh, Latricia has talked about this on past webinars and whatnot. I thought, I think with Jason Mudd, um, just with how important it is to actually very authentically create messaging around purpose and things like inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion, sometimes it's hard for an audience to know what is authentic and what brands are actually bringing to the table and just finding very strategic and authentic ways of doing that is so important, of course, now more than ever. Uh, bringing it over to Latricia and Nicole, who both run their own agencies, I'm curious to hear what you think, just building off of what Ken has shared, what you have felt running your agencies kind of come together in some of these trends and what you noticed the most this year in PR from an agency owner perspective. Um, do you want to jump? Oh, I was going to say, do you want to jump in first? <laughs> Well, I will say um, from an agency owner whose agency portfolio is um, probably 90% organizations and companies led, um, whose organizations and companies are led by people of color and whose team is 100% is made up of people of color. Um, authenticity and trust is huge for our clients, and they want to make sure that they are reaching their target audiences in the most authentic way, because that is how they not just maintain trust, um, but continue on the path where they don't have to wor worry about restoring trust, because um, they because it is kind of the foundation of how they reach their audiences. Um, what we saw in DE, DE and I for my clients was there were a lot of promises made to organizations and companies in 2020 following the murder of George Floyd. Those promises were mostly not carried out going into 2021. So DE and I continues to be a, a concern for companies and organizations and something that a lot of larger companies and organizations still aren't getting right. And it's gonna continue probably into 2023 to be an area of focus for agencies and organizations and corporations alike as they continue to find their formula to be authentic and inclusive and equitable across all the different audiences audiences that they serve, as well as their internal audiences that are helping to create these messages. Mm -hmm, absolutely. A quick follow-up question with that. Um, and, and simple answer, I feel like people are tempted to just say, okay, like if you're being authentic, it'll show. And if you're not, it'll also show. Do you find that some of your clients maybe have an authentic story that they even just are struggling to tell? Like as far as maybe they have something very great going on, but communicating it is the disconnect? Or would you say it's pretty clear when 
there's a good story going on and they're doing good for DE&I and whatnot? I think it's both. Um, and thank you for mentioning that because I, I think there's some client clients that are just so in the weeds of their day to day they don't realize that they have a really great story to tell. And so my team helps them pull, pull that out and build messaging around them. And, and some have a great message and a great story to tell, and they just don't know where to begin. Um, or they think really small and just focus on the media outlets that are closest to them without looking at a larger scale. So we help them in that regard as well. But I think the the more diverse your table can be, the more authentic the offerings coming from your table will be. And at, we have seen that as of late, large brands are continuing to make huge and expensive errors. Balenciaga is, is the most recent because the people at the table are not the right mix of people to catch some of these mistakes before they get out the door. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Like just completely over the head almost. Exactly. Yeah. Nicole, I'd be interested also what you have to say, just leading your agency this year. I know your team is constantly growing and evolving. Um, if there were any trends to you that stood out from this list that you really felt yeah, and and Latricia, I'm so glad that you mentioned the DEI work that companies have done or have failed to do um, because we've seen that as well with um, not only people we've worked with who are struggling to figure out how to you know make make good on the promises that they've made, but so many others. Um, and so I, you know, going back to restoring trust, um, that transparency piece um, certainly has been a big uh, trend this past year, um, not only from the news side or the journalism side, but also from the company um, side um, for transparency to your employees, but also transparency to your consumers, um, whoever they might be, uh, it, it's, it continues to, to trend. Um, I would also focus on that work from home piece. Um, we're seeing, while that is, it's been trendy, right, with the pandemic, um, we've seen, we, we deal with a lot of CPG brands, and so product sampling becomes um, a challenge for us sending out samples to media. Um, and it's a mixed bag now for the past two years. It's, you know, send the sample to my house. So we have everyone's home addresses. Um, but broadcast is certainly almost all back to their offices. If not, they're in a hybrid schedule. Um, and uh, digital as well uh, is a kind of hybrid. Um, and then, you know, print is a mixed bag. But I don't think, I think there are people working from home. Um, but I don't think that everyone is working from home anymore. And that's, you know, been a change. It's not necessarily a trend. I think it's an evolving thing to look at for 2023. Um, and I'm seeing that a lot of people are commenting about how they like to be with other people. Um, so maybe for the extroverts uh, in the group, um, that's probably uh, that's probably trending to go back to the office more so. Um, but that's, that's been something. And then uh, influencer marketing, my goodness, has that evolved in the past year where we were looking at bigger contracts um, for larger influencers uh, pre-pandemic and even into the pandemic. Now we're looking at nano and micro influencers almost exclusively. Um, and that's been a real change um, over the course of 2022 for, for our clients. That's a really interesting point, I would say, because even like you mentioned just a few years ago, influencer marketing, it was like, okay, let's pay this A-list celebrity to make a comment for whatever amounts of thousands of dollars. And it's just so much more nuanced than that, I think now. And I could see how even in your agency, that can become a tactic to recommend or even build for clients and an overall strategy more than I think it's ever been used before. Well, it's an interesting, I mean, it's one of the reasons, not to make this a sales, uh, sales <laughs> for Propel, but it is one of the reasons that we love using Propel is being able to show all the way through to our clients what the value of a media placement actually has done for them. It's true with the influencer side too, which is not a Propel feature yet, um, but a lot, uh, showing um, 
showing that, you know, if you're going to partner with an influencer and spend tens of thousands of dollars for a post, you have to be able to prove the sales on the other end. And, and there's some multiple, right, of what is going out the door that needs to come back in. So if it's $10,000, times four or whatever needs to come back in in sales. And unfortunately, the influencer game has changed so much um, that the value or what, what the clients are seeing back in terms of sales to support that spend doesn't make sense where you can use affiliate marketing or you can um, do uh, arrangements with micro or nano influencers and you can easily kind of recoup um, whatever you've spent in terms of resources, um, in that relationship. Mm -hmm. Totally. Because yeah, brand awareness is great, but it's not enough when especially the economy is showing all sorts of signs and businesses at the end of the day need that concrete information too. That makes a lot of sense. Like it's the other would be a challenge on the reporting side hopefully Propel can come into play there someday here in the near future. Um, Michelle, I'm also curious, as Nicole was starting to mention this whole even work from home era and whatnot, mm -hmm. you've been playing that throughout much of your career, just being more of a PR consultant and freelance PR pro. Um, how do you feel that your own landscape shifted with so many more people being online? And were there any trends here that you felt the most in your role? Well, I do think that um, it's interesting because I've been on my own for so long. And one of the reasons I went on my own was because I wanted more control over my schedule, over my day and where I worked and when I worked and who I worked with. So, I mean, I think we're seeing all those things play out now. And it's like I said, it's pretty interesting because um, I've been on my own for more than 20 years. And so I think that, uh, you know, this trend is, uh, you know, finally catching up to what people really want. And I don't think it's going away. I mean, there are people who want a mix, um, a hybrid, you know, type of arrangement. And I think that that's great. But I also think that for companies, they can save so much money by letting go of their office space and, you know, there's just the commuting, the effect on the environment. So, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why working from home can be a really great solution, um, not only for employees, but for companies too. So, I mean, I, I embrace this trend a hundred percent. So I'm really excited um, to see it and I hope that it uh, continues. Definitely. And with those more extroverted folks, they're are ways to find communities too. Like I love seeing your Twitter communities with the PR chats and whatnot. So there are definitely ways around it. If you're not familiar with uh, Michelle's different Twitter groups, she has a few different live chats on Twitter for PR best practices, especially freelance professionals. So it's pretty great to see. Um, yes, we love it. I will go. Yeah, no problem. I will go ahead and get us into a little bit of our data just before we move on a little look at what we saw. And if you're familiar with Propel, you've seen this before. I apologize, but it is from our latest PR pitching report, and it'll give you a rundown here of what we saw as far as the journalist engagement with PR pitches over a few years at the top there, and then over the course of this year so far. And um, the numbers are in, and we're seeing about a 3% response rate to pitches from journalists. And that is from analyzing hundreds of thousands of pitches each quarter from our anonymous um, aggregation process to analyze what we see there from our users. So not very encouraging numbers. We spoke with uh, Radioactive's leadership team a few days ago, actually, on a webinar, and Rich Lay had a really fun, hot take on that, which is that maybe the response rate is so low because pitches are so good, they don't even need a response, and the article is just going straight to publish. So that would be awesome, but I imagine there's a lot more at play yep. here. You can track that in your business outcomes dashboard. <laughs> you can, if you are a Propel user, you can get to the bottom of that. But for the industry conversation, um, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy to see those numbers. Uh, Michelle, I kind of wanted to ask you what you think about this, especially as a kind of more freelance PR pro. 
what do you think about these numbers as far as your own experience has gone pitching journalists over the years Mm -hmm. and how engagement has shifted? Have you noticed a shift? Yes, it's getting harder, right? I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, We can look at the numbers, but we know, those of us who are in the trenches know that it's getting harder. And I think there are a lot of factors um, that um, contribute to that. But I think, you know, one of the things that we need to really be mindful of is, uh, you know, the pool of journalists is shrinking and the number of pitches they get is growing because we've got link builders out there now. Um, You know, we've got a lot of people who aren't really doing research on who they're pitching and making, you know, creating a thoughtful pitch for those people. Um, You really shouldn't be spamming out the same pitch uh, randomly to hundreds of journalists at a time. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for the person doing it. It makes it harder for the rest of us. Uh, The journalists hate it and they talk about it all the time. And uh, it's just something that we really need to be talking about as an industry. And I do think, you know, there's a role, you know, for everyone to play, including, um, you know, the the vendors, because um, I think that that includes them as well. I just, I don't know that allowing that to go on is, is a great, you know, way for us to, to move forward. So that's, that's one take on it. Mm-hmm. That that brought up for me a little bit of everything old is new again. I was in the business as a young publicist, young public, you know, uh, early eighties, um, and um, some of you weren't even alive then. And the, the notion of we didn't say don't spam, we didn't use that word, but the idea of fine tuning your pitch of understanding the media outlet, of understanding their audience, of being of true value to them, that's where success came from. That notion is now, that you know, four decades ago. So some things don't change. The good news is you all have a lot more tools, I think, to get it right. You're, but the willingness, I think, has to be there. So it just made me laugh a bit. That makes, I mean, again, just to build off of that, like, that's actually really funny. I'm looking at this and I'm trying to, I'm thinking back to my young publicist days in the early nineties and, and, you know, as email was coming online, but you certainly weren't pitching via email. You were calling down, you're doing call downs and you were calling to be like, are you on deadline and praying to God that they wouldn't scream at you. But I wonder, because I'm, we weren't tracking that data and I'm wondering how far off this data is from say the mid to late nineties in terms of uh, successful pitching, right? Because you have to be lucky to get somebody on the phone or that you responded to a fax maybe um, to be able to, to, get, to get a story placed um, and have that online, have that dialogue on the phone or in person. And, and now we have all of this data. I'm just wondering if we've maybe reached a peak in terms of digital um, digital outreach um, that has now maybe is now leveling out um, some just because, you know, thinking back to how successful I might have been on pitching on the phone, you know, my full list of people that I pulled together from the Bacon's books, um, you know, in, in that time to now. To now. And, I, you know, I, I, in uh, my team, I know we do call downs, right? If we've pitched a bunch and we've followed up and we haven't had the success that we needed to you know, in email or other forms of digital communication, we're calling them and we're getting a response uh, and usually a very friendly response, even if it's a no. And so I, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if we've just maybe reached this apex of like, there's so much going out into the ether through technology that we have to have a mix of what's old and what's, and I'm not pointing at any of us as old, but what's old and what's, what's, what's new to work together. Definitely. And I think even an aspect, like you're saying, just so many new tools like that can be so exciting and easy to overdo it. So we see just, oh, I can send a mass email. How about I just do it? Like, who cares? And a sense of hiding behind the screen, even like you would never call someone like You know, you would never call a hundred people to pitch the same thing at one sitting, but because you can click a button, it happens. And so 
I think hopefully we do start to see that level out and shift in the right direction and people see what's working and what's not and start to really respect journalists more because I've heard time and time again, they get hundreds of pitches, some of them every day, which I cannot imagine mixed in with the rest of the daily emails. Um, Latricia, I'm curious if you've seen any of these trends unfold at your agency or as far as guiding your team on the ground pitching about how to navigate such a busy media relations landscape. Some, but uh the majority of the media outlets that we work with are minority owned outlets. So we get a little bit better response. Um, when you were joking earlier about maybe the rate is so low because they just took the pitch and ran with it, that does happen for us sometimes um, because you know we built up some relationships with outlets that they pretty much know if we send a press release, we've kind of checked all the boxes and did the legwork for them and they can pretty much run it. Um, so we're blessed in, in that aspect. Uh, we also have worked a lot with local media that we've been able to build some relationships that have been working for three or four years where we have clients that are regularly on as subject matter, matter experts that it's just kind of... Um, turnkey for us that they're going to be on twice a month or things like that and and not pay to play. So I think for us, uh, there are some sweet spots that we've really been able to work on and get a lot of traction through. But still, when we're looking or working outside of those sweet spots, yes, we are seeing some of these numbers as, as far as responsiveness from journalists in other areas and more on a national basis. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And that's great to hear that some of those pitches are just silently going straight to publish. That might be the best case besides it being a little confusing or wondering if it landed. But yeah, that's great to hear kind of the variety too, because you do have your CNNs and your Wall Street journals and all of those outlets that you're like, they're never going to respond. But some smaller outlets really, really will and can be super successful. And that's where it's very important to consider where your audience is spending their time, because maybe they're not even reading at those bigger outlets to get their information. So it's and that's a good point when we're thinking uh, when we go back to that authentic communication, those outlets have huge readership and, and it's been legacy leadership, le legacy readership, I'm sorry, for generations. So when you are wanting to speak to a certain audience of color, look at those outlets and focus on those more than you, than the larger outlets that you've been thinking of. And I think you'll get a better response rate um, because they, they have a good following. Their staffs are easy to work with and they're a great place, not just to pitch your articles, but to spend advertising dollars as well. Yeah. And then it's, I mean, a win-win to be supporting these people and helping them play in that playing field of the larger news outlets. It's just all around a win-win, it sounds. Uh, but thank you all. We'll start to get into the, we've touched on predictions a bit as we've unpacked the past year, but I'd love to get into that a little bit more and what we think we might see. I mean, the new year is only a few weeks away at this point. So let's chat a little bit about what we expect to see. I know I love this gif. <laughs> Had to throw it in there. So <laughs> just generally in 2023, PR will be what? So Latricia, what are just some of your hot, like immediate takes, hot takes, anything that you think is going to carry forward, especially you think something's going to emerge that we haven't even seen yet, anything like that? Well, I'm, I'm going to stay in the DE&I DE lens um, because we have to continue to work on our communications and our messaging as communicators. So things like these people, we need to stop saying. And so 
uh, these people, those people, we're all people. So if we're speaking to specific outlets or specific communities, we need to go ahead and speak to those communities in, in the terminology that works best and is most inclusive. I continue to think that as far as DE and I in communications, that is not going to change until counselors change. We are the counsel for our for our clients, we are the counsel for our organizations. And if we do not press them and push them to be where we need them to be on the right side of DE and I, they're not going to get there. So we have to step up and be the conscience for our clients and the conscience for our organizations so we can truly impact the change in DE and I as far as communications that we wish to see. So I think for 2023, we're going to continue to see major faux pas in, in messaging and content creation. And so we need to work proactively with our clients to make sure they are not the ones that end up on TV with the next major uh crisis as far as communications and inclusive communications. So DE and I is still going to be in the top two for me in 2023 because we're we're still not where we need to be as an industry or or just in business across the board. Right. And I really love what you were saying about just having the right people at the table. Like if you have 10 people from the same background, it's going to be so easy to just miss things absolutely even genuinely miss them versus say you have 10 people from completely different backgrounds it's like okay it's so obvious that you shouldn't have said that like how could you have even thought that like those backgrounds coming together you can very very clearly see what's appropriate and what's not versus just the same people of course and to that point Samantha not not just having 10 people at the table of different backgrounds, but making sure that they are all comfortable speaking their mind and speaking up to say, you know what, this doesn't quite feel right for me. Mm -hmm. And when we look at some different wording or some different imaging, because it's one thing to have a diverse table, but if I feel that I cannot adequately express myself without repercussion, then I'm going to sit at the table, but I'm not going to say anything. So right. empowering your team to feel that they have skin in the game that they can, you know, speak out, speak up and, you know, share their, share their expertise to make the campaign even better. Absolutely. Like avoiding just having a token of diversity and whatnot, which is of course so problematic, like actually asking everyone, what do you think? And let's build this together and yeah, not making it kind of like a fake representation. Um, thank you for that. Um, Nicole, what are you thinking for 2023? Are you, is your team planning for anything in specific as far as what you expect to see in PR in the coming year and what the landscape will look like? You know, I, we're continuing to kind of wrestle with the whole affiliate um, piece uh, and it's growing and growing. I mean, if you look at Wirecutter and the New York Times, that's all affiliates, right? And there are more uh, Meredith Dash is a lot of affiliate placements. There's just a lot, a, a lot of uh, pitching now, um, at least, and I would say this is going to extend beyond market editors and anybody covering CPG that it will bleed over into um, uh, B2B, it will bleed over into just about everything because obviously publications are trying to figure out how to monetize and this is a way to do that. So they still retain editorial, uh, some sort of editorial, but the, the links all pay for themselves. So um, we've been able to see, you know, some great success for a lot of our clients in that area, um, but we anticipate that this will just continue to grow as more publications have to kind of shift tack to figure out how to stay alive um, and continue to support themselves and the journalists that work for them. So we're bracing for that. Um, that's been an interesting learning curve. Um, and then, you know, really we're, we're doing a lot more with our clients to help them really understand them and decipher the meaning, the work that we're doing and how it's impacting their business 
um, in, in all, all of the ways. So certainly the data is really important that we're able to share with them, but also um, just helping them learn about how far reaching communications is within their organizations, within their local communities, um, in addition to their customers. And so, um, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of kind of deep dives um, that are that were kind of not taken for granted previously, um, because they weren't, but because of the way social media works and our online communities work now, I think it, communicators, our profession, our work is even more vital. Um, but there's just a lot more ground to cover. Absolutely. There is a lot to plan for. And I think the time and the way things change only just exponentially increases. So that's important to be thinking about all of this now, of course. Uh, Michelle, what are you thinking, especially just from your more uh, unique lens as an independent PR pro, what are you planning for now? What do you think we'll see in 2023 for independent practitioners? I think a lot of independents are looking at the possibility of a recession. And I think that that can be an opportunity for um, independents because as companies uh, lay people off, they still need to get the work done, the projects done. And I wrote down some statistics, 71% of in-house marketers and 68% of agencies are looking to hire freelancers, um, not only in PR, of course, but in various creative roles. And they're looking for strategic doers, um, which I love because that's kind of how I've always seen myself. I like to get my hands dirty I actually like to do the work in addition to just helping, you know, formulate the plan and come up with a strategy. I feel like without the actual execution, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's just, it's half, you know, half a, half an effort. So um, I was, I, I just really love to see that. And I think that, um, that, that, well, recession isn't great, of course, in a lot of ways, um, it can create opportunities if you're positioned right and you're ready to take advantage because I see, I've seen a lot of agencies, not only recently, but in the past few years, really looking for help. And that's where I um, tell freelancers that are newer um, and maybe having trouble getting you know, projects and clients and work to look to agencies because they seem like they always need help. So, mm -hmm, Absolutely. And just remembering that many businesses know that you can't just cut out marketing or communications or PR, like especially in these turbulent times that can be the most valuable thing for keeping sales going. And not that PR is about sales or ever should be, but they are connected when it comes to budgeting for hiring communications help. So there is optimism there for the industry, I would say as well, just with what you're saying, as far as picking up the slack and making sure that the communication strategy is very on point in a difficult time. Um, Ken, are you hearing um, any of these sorts of conversations when talking with your different um, PR leadership clients? Are they trying to figure out 2023 yet? And if oh, so... Yeah. yeah, what are what are some of those conversations like for you? Yeah, well, one thing we've been training about, presenting about, is sort of this ongoing era of uncertainty that I think continues. And just some of them came up just in the last few minutes, but will we have a recession or not? What's going on with gas prices? What's going on with Russia and Ukraine? Will there be another pandemic, you know, or, uh, variant? all those things. So I think that's almost the broader, you know, umbrella. So as a result, you know, we're we're seeing things like agency leaders predicting strong Q1s, even raising their rates, but much more ambivalent about the rest of the year. I'm seeing leaders wanting some guidance or coaching around are there special strengths or skills that I bring to lead through uncertainty? The answer is absolutely yes. It's like leadership on steroids. I think from an agency perspective, because of the uncertainty, you know, I think the ability to prove our worth with metrics and to add value to our clients' businesses and client reputation is absolutely essential. And if you look back 
to the agencies, for example, or the brands or organizations who got through the big turndown in 2008 and 9, they found ways to, you know, they, they, they didn't grow their marketing or PR budgets, certainly, but they didn't do the big cutbacks that a lot of their competitors were doing. And so when that recessionary period ended, they came out, you know, m- much more ahead, much more ahead. So we're seeing all of that and discussing all of that. And the only little thing, a little more tactical than the other things we've mentioned, but figuring out that balance between management's desire to return to the office much more and many employees saying, wait a minute, not so fast. You know, I've enjoyed not commuting. I've enjoyed um, having some time back to myself. So, uh, and, and I think, you know, understanding that the extroverts get energy from being with others and maybe your introverts don't. And then, and then as finally, as you bring people back, make that time meaningful. Don't have them in the office, just all doing work individually. That's where you have collaboration and creativity and brainstorming, as well as the proverbial water cooler discussion, which is harder to get from home. And then and then when when people are working from home, that's when they do, for example, their writing or research or things where you don't need to to be around other people. Yeah, definitely. And I'm even thinking about just how used to these new remote environments some of us have gotten socializing all day at the office five days a week, like that's going to be exhausting for some people. So being understanding and very strategic about how and when you work together in person on projects is probably really important with that. And if I can add, as far as authentic leadership and leadership communications, you know, if you've been telling your teams for, is it two years now, two and a half years, hey, great work. You were able to do that from home. Fantastic. Great collaboration. And suddenly you switch and say, but we've all got to be together. Well, wait, you've been telling me for two and a half years that we're killing it. So yeah, you can tell me there are advantages of working together and coming back the right way and collaborating the right way. But to suddenly say, we've got to all be together five days a week, that that's just not going to play. You're just, you're not going to get followership from that, in my opinion. It's not going to be easy to justify. I'm not even sure, like you said, I don't know if you genuinely can justify it after what we've seen. So that will be really interesting, definitely, to see how a lot of different businesses continue to navigate that. Uh, also, I just, can that. I jump in super quick yeah. on this? Just sure. just to offer a word of caution is just. Yes, this is true on the PR and the agency side and the freelancer side, right? We have the ability to, you know, work from home, many of us. And I, we talk about it in my office as well, well, this is a first world problem. Lucky us, we can work, we can work shift and be anywhere. But remember, if you're producing a story for NPR or on NBC News or anywhere else, you have to, like, they've made accommodations to get people at home as much as they could during the pandemic. And because of the nature of those businesses, they've had to shift back to work. So just to think about, as you're talking about this as a whole, our industry, PR, marketing, advertising, right? Many of us can stay home, but there's so many industries that require a frontline staff or people to actually broadcast from a certain place. So Uh, We've been really careful in speaking with our media friends to be like, oh, where should we send something to you? Because that way we know, because we can't always assume people are at home first or that's even an option for them. That's really big and just brings a good reminder to just be empathetic and sympathetic and all of the above to different groups that you're working with, especially the media, because they're already angry with PR in a lot of ways, not all of them, and it's not all encompassing, but being really understanding is super important, especially like you're saying, a broadcast reporter is on the ground, like hands on all the time, and they're not sitting on their couch. So that's, you know, that, that brings back this notion of, you know, 
don't be that guy or that <laughs> woman with, with so many publicists and PR folks still getting it wrong. And I don't think it's the majority by any means. I don't even know that it's a big minority, but when they get it wrong, if you're getting it right, you're still going to stand out to that media person as the one who helped me do my job. And again, I, I for those of you doing math, by the way, I started my career in 79. So now it's been six decades of that, six decades, <laughs> not 60 years, but six decades of be of value to the media, help them do their job better. I, I hope that never changes. Absolutely. But I, I will I will say in, in working with the media because because we're still in this strange position, don't be afraid to ask them what their preference is, especially if you have a client that's that would prefer to be um, interviewed via Zoom because of their their what they have to work with. Like I, I have a client that's that's an OBGYN. She does not want to put her patients at risk any more than she has to. So when they interview her, we're like, can we do this via Zoom? And they understand she's a doctor and she's seeing patients. They're like, we're more than okay with that. So don't be afraid to advocate for your clients as long as you're helping that media outlet get what they need. And then it's a win-win on both sides. Absolutely. Just showing understanding. And of course, both groups have their goals. Everyone's doing their job. So that is true. We we do have to stick up for what we're doing as long as we're doing it in an appropriate, respectful way. Um, Michelle and I talked a little bit earlier before this about misinformation and how to approach that in from a PR lens. And as we move into a new year, uh, Michelle, I was curious if you wanted to share a little bit about what you recommend in preparing for a new year in PR. You mentioned you had some advice or suggestions about how to combat um, probably another year <laughs> of battling misinformation and battling trust issues with the media and PR. Isn't it fun? I mean, it just never ends. <laughs> Um, but yeah, trust is everything, right? I mean, trust is everything, uh, trust between us and our clients, trust between our clients and the media, trust between the clients and their other audiences, their publics, um, their investors, uh, their potential buyers. I mean, it's everything. So um, I feel like as trust in the media declines and we see that continue to happen, we may have to start paying more attention to our own um, content, publishing our own content, for example, which you can then repurpose um, following the peso model, you can um, own the content, then you can turn it into earned media, then you can share the content on social media, and you can even pay to boost the content. So that's the model that I'm kind of focused on now for clients. And it is, um, there, there, there are some ways to be successful that way, focusing on industry trades, for example, their staffs are shrinking, they need content, they love great um, thought leadership articles and subject matter experts to interview and things like that. So I think that's a good place to focus. And then, of course, it was mentioned earlier, transparency um, and just, you know, if you do something wrong, you're going to get caught. And I hope that that will start to kind of sink in even more. I do think companies are realizing the importance of having a PR professional at the table, not only to clean up the mess, but to, on an ongoing basis to stay out there consistently, to um, you know, help get the right messages out, and just kind of be, you know, be around at all times to help counsel and um, kind of lead the way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and have that seat at the table. And like we were saying earlier, sometimes what you're doing is great, and your messaging is what you need a little help with, but also it's obvious when you're doing something wrong, especially in the PR world, like people will know if something's up. So just doing internal work, like you're saying on your own channels to be making a good change and doing things authentically is a very important starting place way before earned media is concerned. Um, anyways, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So we'll start to wrap up the discussion today. It's been amazing. And I think there's a lot for everyone listening to think about and getting ready for a new year. I wanna wrap it up by opening the floor to our panelists to offer any just lasting advice about 
staying up to date and staying ahead of the curve in PR. So as we've seen, things change so fast and all the time in all kinds of ways. A few highlights from a webinar we just recently had about just embodying the modern PR pro were to just really hone in on continued education opportunities like webinars like we're doing now, um, assessing your own team results, looking at your own benchmarks, looking at industry benchmarks. So those are a few really important places to start. Um, but I wanted to ask, of course, our guest today, like Latricia has been involved at a leadership level with a few different PR communities, um, including the National PR Chair for Top Ladies of Distinction most recently. So do you have any advice for where PR pros could stay ahead of the curve? Oh, definitely continuing education, like you said. So I will do my shameless pitch for PRSA Counselors Academy, Ooh. which will take place May 8th through the 10th in New Orleans. And you can definitely learn more about that at caprsa.org or prsa.org. I can say that because I am the chair. So I am going to make sure that there is dynamic content to help you continue your education to stay ahead of the curve. And um, so I look forward to seeing you there, but definitely keep, keep reading, keep learning, keep engaging with diverse professionals like the one we have on, on this webinar, on the ones that we have on this webinar, because iron sharpens iron. And I have learned so much from all three of you and Samantha as our moderator today. So uh, just, that's it. Awesome. Thank you. And Nicole as well. I actually met Nicole in Arizona at a PRSA conference where we were both continuing our education. Um, but she's actually taken the educator role in universities. So Nicole, you know all about that. Do you have any advice as well, just either continued education related or even outside of that for staying ahead of trends and being super ready for all the changes? Yeah, and I would, Latricia, I'm so excited about New Orleans. That's, this is going to be great because Arizona was mind blowing for me. It was my first meeting and wow, uh, I'm still working through all of my notes to take advantage of all of the things that I've learned. I have an active, actually, notebook full of them that sits on my desk. Um, anyhow, the I think, of course, um, ongoing education. And I think it's important that people realize that that's really up to you as an individual to continue learning as a lifelong endeavor. Um, but for your career, that's really on you as opposed to having somebody, hopefully people do give you those opportunities, but you should really be seeking them out on your own. Um, but also, you know, it, we have a pretty active internship program at Juniper, and um, I highly encourage people to get involved with their local colleges and universities or even high schools um, to start thinking about what the next generation of our industry looks like. It's been fantastic, I think, for every member of my team to be engaged with our collegiate interns um, in that way. Um, and then for other things that just looking ahead to the new year, and, and I, I feel like a broken record when I say this, but I think everybody needs to be mindful of their crisis plan in these days and ages and dust it off. It's that time of year. If it tends to be slow between Christmas and the new year, take a few hours, read through what you have. If you don't have a crisis plan, perhaps put together like a couple of pages just to outline what you have, but it it should be refreshed so that as you head into the new year, if something, God forbid, does happen, um, that you're ready to go and that you at least have some sort of semblance of a, of a place to jump off from. So um, that's always a great thing to do as you're as you're planning for a new year. Mm -hmm. And that's rookie mistake. Number one is starting the crisis plan after the crisis. So let's not put ourselves in that boat. That's a really good reminder. We're in the middle of the crisis. <laughs> Oh man. Okay. I don't even want to get into it on this moment. Um, whole another webinar. Yeah, that's that could be a whole hour in itself or much more. Um, Michelle, what what do you have as your advice to staying ahead with the curve? You run your own continuing education workshops, if you will, on Twitter um, and offer so much great advice in different 
articles I've seen. Um, what do you what do you like using to stay ahead of the curve personally? Well, I mean, I think you're only as good as the company you keep. So I love to follow people like Jenny Dietrich, like Frank Strong, for example. They are um, a couple of folks that I learn a lot from and I, I follow them and read what they share. I think obviously webinars um, and um, I think I hope that Twitter stays around because I just learn so much from engaging um, with other PR pros there. And we do have our um, space every Friday at noon, PR Lunch Hour, where we um you know, we kind of get an idea of what is on people's minds, um, PR and comms pros. So I think that that's been a really, um, a really great way for, for me to kind of stay on top of what's, uh, what's on people's minds. Awesome. Thank you. And Ken, last but not least, any yeah. lasting so advice? I've got four, but they're fast. But since we've re referenced Ginny, you know, it is the peso model TM which was created by Ginny Dietrich of Armand Dietrich. Just going to give her that little hat tip. Um, but but the four are real fast: lead first, manage second, acknowledge that you lead human beings, understand and improve your empathy, understand and improve your emotional intelligence, learn how your team members perceive your leadership. If they don't perceive it the right way, they don't follow you. If they don't follow you, you're not leading. You can't fix it if you don't know it. So find out your blind spots, which leads to number three, don't go it alone. Explore hiring a leadership coach or an executive coach. I'm happy to discuss what that really is and isn't and is coaching right for you. You can reach out to me via the contact information we'll have at the end. And last would be self-care. Take care of yourself, whether it's mindfulness, meditation, more exercise, nutrition, getting out in the sun, any of those things that work and start with yourself. When like when you travel on airlines, you, you put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you take care of others. Do the same in your own organizations. Make 2023 the year of self-care. I love that. Thank you so much for all of this, everyone. Um, if you have any questions for our awesome panel, um, we have some contact information here. If you want to just reach out, connect with them, I'm sure they they love it. They've offered up this contact information voluntarily. So don't be afraid to connect with them and ask questions, continue the conversation. If you have any questions for me, you can email me directly. My email is right here. And I will go ahead and wrap us up. Thank you everyone so much for being here, for listening and to our panel for all the great advice today. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.